Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Meadows Museum and our interviewer, Daniela Cruz, speaks with curator Amanda Dotseth about their exhibition, Fortuni, Friends and Followers. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Amanda Dotseth at the Meadows Museum to talk about the exhibition, Fortuni, Friends and Followers. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome, I'm happy to be here. So this exhibition focuses on Mariano Fortuni and a lot of his contemporaries and kind of exhibits all of the different facets of their work. Can you talk a little bit about curating the exhibition and how that came about? Sure. There were, there were a few sort of specific things that led to the idea of the exhibition. One is the painting right here, um, this lovely painting behind us, which the Meadows Re uh, Museum acquired only recently, and it's Fortuny's last painting. He actually passed away before he could finish painting it, although it is, I would say, probably 99% finished. There's a few figures that he just didn't quite get to before he passed away at the young age of 36. So there was this painting, and then we also have this wonderful long-term loan from the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. of one of Fortuny's most celebrated paintings. And, and by most celebrated, I mean during his lifetime and after his death. This painting was very popular even while he was alive. And that's called The Choice of a Model. So we had those two kind of components. And then the Meadows Museum also recently acquired a small oil sketch by Fortuny called Crouched Arab. And this is, um, you know, it's only about that big, and it's just a very rapid sketch he did in preparation for a larger painting. So we had this sort of group of objects that really made us think about Fortuny and the moment in time he inhabited, the people who surrounded him, and all of these things that made Fortuny an important artist and in the history of art, but also a household name during his lifetime, even if perhaps not that many people have heard of him now. So with these sort of core objects, the key objects from the Meadows collection from of late 19th century uh, Spanish painting by artists who knew Fortuny, who learned from Fortuny, who admired Fortuny, and then also a number of works on paper and prints and drawings, we sort of took that and ran with it looking to mostly local collections, private collections, um, local public collections like the Dallas Museum of Art, the San Antonio Museum of Art, the MFA in Houston, and used those key loans to flesh out this idea of Fortuny and his circle and his friends and followers, as the, as the title suggests. Can you talk a little bit about Fortuny's early life, the influence of his family, and maybe his artistic training? Sure. Fortuny, Fortuny is from Catalonia, and he trained as an academic painter in Barcelona, so he's a formally trained academic painter, but he also went to Rome to study. He had a kind of diverse uh, training, and that would be related later in his life. I think one of the things that we highlight in the exhibition and one of the things that, that really defined him and defined the, the, not only his friends, but the, the sheer size and number of his followers is this kind of cosmopolitanism that is characteristic of his life and training. So he left Spain. He didn't just stay in Barcelona or maybe go to Madrid, but he left Spain for Paris and for Rome and even for uh, Naples, which is where he painted the painting behind us in Portici, just outside of Naples. So he traveled, and I would say his commercial success was particularly important in Paris because his dealer, Adolphe Goupil, was there. So these are all sort of key factors, and, and I'll point out again, you know, he passed away at only 36 years of age, so when we talk about his early life and career, it's for many artists, it, it would end right around the time he passed away. But I think all of these friends and followers that he acquired on his study, the people who came with him on these journeys, were key to his artistic training. When it comes to his family, which you mentioned, and his family shows up frequently in this exhibition. In fact, they're in the painting behind us. He depicted his wife and young son in, in this painting. 
His family was important because he married Cecilia de Madrazzo. Madra the Madrazzo family was perhaps the first kind of major uh, artistic dynasty of Spain in the 19th century. First, not, not in terms of primacy, but first in terms of most important. And Madrazzos were directors of the Prado Museum, court painters to royalty, really important society painters, and the whole family, it was a whole family of artists, Fortuny married into that. So his brother-in-laws were very important to his career as well. And I think we see that kind of access to other artists, the access to established artists um, among his friends also led to his followers growing. He had a bit of an entourage, I would say, like a modern celebrity. I really love the, um, in the first gallery that we're in, this kind of giant image that is blown up on the wall and is really life-size it it really highlights the relationship that existed between himself, his family, and his followers. So that's a really lovely thing about the exhibition. Um, now, he was academically trained, as are most of the artists mm -hmm. in the exhibition, but Fortuny set himself apart as he kind of straddled the line between the academic, but then kind of this experimental style. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that set him apart from some of his contemporaries? Sure. I would say his earlier works and earlier in his career, we see the product of academic training, and I don't want to emphasize that to suggest that he was slavishly copying, uh, but it did mean his skills was hon were honed in a way that was very traditionally established at the time. Uh, studies of figures, of uh, figure drawings, and just really practicing, and he was an excellent draftsman, and so I think we, we have to remember that that core artistic skill as a draftman is sort of at, at the base of all of this. And I say this knowing we're in front of a painting that is very painterly. It doesn't necessarily show that kind of rigorous, um, realistic, let's say, or naturalistic, um, slavish kind of copying of making something look exactly as it looks to our eye. So as he, as he moves throughout his career, I think we see him developing outside of a traditional, maybe academic training, although it's still there, it's at the core of his works. And a number of the drawings, for example, in the exhibition show that. But he also starts sp experimenting more with what, what we would certainly now call impressionism. So this idea of using rapid brush strokes to render light and really focusing on light. And in this painting, for example, he's painting outside, he's painting en plein air. So, you know, you can imagine him with his canvas and the easel out on the beach with the sea breezes. And, and in one of his letters, he said that he was trying to capture every single ray of light. So there is a huge departure here from the other painting I mentioned in this exhibition um, on loan from the National Gallery, The Choice of a Model, which is a much more studio created indoors. The painting itself takes place indoors, so there's a good relationship there, and meticulously painted. So we have him painting meticulously, but here towards the end of his life, becoming much looser, more impressionistic, and unfortunately, he passes away before we know what he would do next. Well, it's such um, a wonderful exhibit in the way that it's organized kind Thank of you. by theme mm -hmm. um, to really illustrate kind of the breadth of his work as well as a lot of his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So Fortuny's greatest patron, William H. Stewart, was said to have one of the best 19th century um, art collection, modern collections of the time. And he kept meticulous notes and things, but this was all kept in an album. And so how did the album that's a part of the Meadows collection, how did that influence the exhibit? So we, we noticed as we were pulling together, as we, as we were actually really trying to identify who do we highlight from Fortuny's vast, let's say, circle of friends and followers. And the, one of the sources to do that was specifically with this wonderful object that the uh, Meadows Museum acquired some years ago called the Stewart Album. William Hood Stewart was one of the most important, I would say, collectors, happens to be American, which is great for <laughs> an American institution focused on Spain. 
Um, but he, he not only supported a number of French academic painters, but in particular Spanish academic painters, um, among them Fortuny. He was one of Fortuny's most important patrons. And in this album, which is organized by artists, by um, alphabetically, a number of artists are represented, and most of them knew Fortuny in some way. Minimally, by being in the album, we know they shared a patron in William Hood Stewart, but many of them are also friends, and a lot of the letters, so this album that contains, contains photographs, uh, photographic reproductions of paintings, but also these cartes de visite, these kind of photographic calling cards that were so popular in the 19th century, but it also includes personal letters and drawings. And so we, we, it helped shape the exhibition by, you know, if we had a wonderful drawing by Viber, for example, and maybe in that letter, Viber references if not Fortuny specifically, but things that related to, to that world, then we could also think, okay, from here, maybe we'll include a painting by Viber, which we did. Same thing with Meissonier um, and a number of the other artists. One in particular that comes to mind is Zamacois, who's a, a Spanish painter who actually trained with Meissonier, but references the fact that he's kind of hanging out with Fortuny and Rico and Madrazzo. And so you get a sense from these letters of how close the circle was. This wasn't just people Fortuny saw in Paris or knew were other painters, but we have actual documentary evidence that they visited each other's studio and traveled together and painted together. That's really incredible. It, it's just like, um an incredible historical document it is. Uh, that's like really amassed all of these wonderful things. Mm -hmm. And um, Stewart's collection is really, um, or his patronage is really evident in kind of this collecting. And I, I really love the sketch for choice of a model yes. that was gifted to him later by Fortuny's widow. Mm -hmm. Now he did die, like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. at a very young age. Yes. How do you think his influence carried on after his death? Well, there's, there's a number of ways I think it did that. One is kind of, we can highlight the, the fact that his collection spread out. So after Fortuny died, we, we know he was so popular during his lifetime, of course. He sold paintings before they were even finished. And, but then he dies, of course, and the outputs, that's it. However, there was a number of things left in the atelier in his studio. So there was a major auction in Paris the year after his death in 1875. And this painting was among the things that were left unfinished and were sold at that point. People from all over bought from that auction. So in this case, it was bought by an American collector. And so this painting came very soon to the US. We know William Merritt Chase, the great American painter of the 19th century and 20th, probably saw this painting um, at the Chicago World's Fair, for example. So I think this impact happened not only because of this kind of legacy of his fame during his lifetime, because I think it's worth pointing out he was a celebrity and not just you know, a, a great commercial painter but also because the diffusion of his works of art meant that artists as far afield as you know, New York City had, had access to his paintings and could, could fall in love with him through his paintings. So we have that. The other thing is Fortuny's dealer, Goupil, was very good at marketing and he, he encouraged Fortuny to, to make prints. And so Fortuny was also a really, really talented printmaker and we have a number of prints from the permanent collection on view in this exhibition. When you wanna talk about diffusion and creating interest in a particular artist, prints are a great way to do it right. because they're relatively inexpensive, you, they're produced in multiples and they can travel even more for, you know, further and more widely than, than paintings. So I think that is kind of how his legacy became important. The result of that is artists as diverse as Vincent van Gogh, we know, really valued Fortuny's prints. William Merritt Chase, who I mentioned, really, really admired Fortuny and his watercolors and his paintings through his work, through knowing them, even though the two artists never met. 
other artists like Joaquin Soroya, the Spaniard who came along later, that legacy makes a little more sense in the sense that, you know, it's, it's Spain. Right. And same with Salvador Dali, who I mentioned um, one of our recent acquisitions is this lovely oil sketch called Crouched Arab. We know that was a study for a painting that Salvador Dali owned. So there is, I think, a mixture of the, the kind of weight of his celebrity and success and legacy in Spain and other artists wanting to emulate that, and then also the diffusion of his artworks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a wonderful exhibit, and I'm really fortunate to have been able to visit today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. We want to thank Amanda for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to meadowsmuseumdallas.org. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar.